Hey everyone, welcome to this week's Azure Infrastructure Update. It's the 10th of May and just a couple of updates this week. As always, I have the chapters, so you can jump to any particular update you care about the most. New videos this week. So this video has been in the planning for a month, but it's been a huge amount of work. But pass keys, uh, what they are, how they're working under the covers, while why they are powerful, how the trust, how the protections work, and then how we can leverage them with Entra and with our Microsoft accounts. So it's just over an hour, but I go through all of that detail and exactly how it's functioning and the standards it's leveraging. Onto the updates so on the compute side, VMSS flexible orchestration modes. This is the newer mode, different from uniform, where I can have regular VMs in there with a particular set that I define based on a template, their regular virtual machines now has a standby pull in preview. So what this lets me do is I can define a max ready capacity, let's say 15. And then whatever the delta is between that max ready and the current instance count, we put into a standby pool. Now the benefit here is that it will provision those VMs, go through any initialization that may take time, and then I can control the state in which they'll be in that standby pool. Now I could have them allocated, that would mean I'm still paying the compute charges, in which case, why would I bother putting them in standby pool? I'd probably just leave them in the VMSS being active. And so what most people will do is deallocate them, but the disk is still there ready. So if I have to start it, it's gonna be that much faster to be part of the set or hibernation is coming. That means it will be up and running even quicker. So it's all about, hey, if I have workloads that take some time when I do that scale out action, I have to go for initialization, I can pre-do those initializations. They'll be up and ready that much faster. Azure Red Hat OpenShift, this is the managed offering from Microsoft and Red Hat now supports 4.14 uh, provisioning time. Azure Container Apps, which remember, abstract away the Azure Kubernetes service underneath, adds things like Dapper for microservices, adds things like CADA for better auto scaling, adds different types of sidecar for network capabilities. We now supports an Azure Files NFS share. So my benefit here is I get the performance, the scale of Azure Files and if an NFS service, but NFS, because it's a file-based protocol, is also shareable. So I could have multiple different pods connecting to the same share. So that will give me some shared storage for them. And then AKS for a Windows-based node pool I can now select outbound NAT disable. So remember, NAT is where I have, there's a port I'm using for my outbound flow, for example, on my pod, and then on the host, it uses a different port and it translates between them. It lets things that, for example, don't have a public IP or an IP on a real network talk to that network. Well, now I can disable that NAT if it's interrupting with certain types of service. Now, obviously, if I turn the NAT off, then I can't use a load balancer as the outbound type anymore because load balancers, they use NAT. I would have to use something like NAT Gateway. I could use a user defined route. But hey, that's now an option for those Windows based pools. And AKS initialization taints has gone into preview. So normally we have taints and they're things we mark on the nodes. For example, hey, um, I'm GPU or I only accept this type of workload. Then on the workload, we specify, hey, I have a tolerance to that taint, which would make it go and use that particular type of node. Well, now we have initialization taints, which are designed to be much shorter term. Maybe, as the name suggests, I need some time when that node starts up or is recreated to complete some tasks before I want pods scheduled onto it. So now I have these initialization taints, but the benefit here is I can remove them just with the Kubernetes API. I don't have to use the AKS uh, APIs to do that. So once it's ready, hey, I can just remove it with the Kubernetes API. If I do scale, if I do upgrade, those initialization taints will come back. And VS Code AKS extension has been updated to version 1.4.3. So if I'm uh, experimenting, I'm using VS Code to work with AKS, uh, we have a new version. On the networking side, so Azure Front Door Log Scrubbing has gone GA. So the whole point of this is in the log, I may have what I consider sensitive data. 
There might be sensitive data in the request URI, in the request IP address, uh, the query string, the various argument names within there. So I can select for those three things which of them I wish to be scrubbed and any sensitive values will be replaced with the asterisk character, splat, wildcard, whatever you call it. It will hide that away. That's only for standard and premium. So if I'm using a standard premium profile, then I can use that scrubbing. Onto storage. So Azure Storage Actions, remember these enable me to perform actions at scale on my blob storage, on my data lake. They're available in 14 additional regions. This is again in preview. And also Ultra Disk. Remember, this is the super stuperest disk there is right now. Highest IOPS, highest throughput, lowest latency. Enables me to change the IOPS and the throughput independently and dynamically when it's being used. Uh, it's now available in Italy North as well. That's useful for my really high disk intensive workloads, maybe my top tier database, for example, SAP workloads. On the database side, Cosmos DB API for MongoDB. Remember, Cosmos DB supports various APIs. So the API for MongoDB, when I'm using the request units, now supports version five and six of the MongoDB. So the benefit here is, hey, I can use my regular MongoDB client to go and communicate with this, and now I support that higher version. Cosmos DB Data Explorer has added keyboard shortcuts. So they've got a whole list of these shortcuts, but essentially if I go to cosmos.azure.com or I can get there from the portal, there's now all these little friendly shortcuts to go and do cool stuff. So if I'm a keyboard warrior, uh, I can now learn those shortcuts and don't have to touch that mouse thing. Cosmos DB has now enabled customer managed keys. So that's where the key that's used for that second level encryption is in my Azure Key Vault can be enabled on existing accounts. I don't have to go and create a brand new account and migrate the data. I can take an existing account. It is at the account level, but I can now go and change that to a customer managed key for that extra level of encryption. Now, when I do this, it is still using my request units to perform that encryption. It won't interfere with your production workload. It will use the spare RUs, but ideally do this in an off-peak quiet time so it can complete that a little bit quicker. It doesn't really matter. Maybe you'd add some RUs for that process, but just bear in mind, it does have to go and do that encryption and it is using your request units to do that. PostgreSQL Flexible has new minor version support 16.2, 15.6, 14.11, 13.14, and 12.18, and now all supported. You'll get these automatically as part of the monthly plan maintenance for uh, Postgres for Flexible Server. And Postgres SQL Flexible has a new time scale database extension. So if I have time series data, this enables me to work with that time series data and the new version of the extension, which implements this time scale database, just brings additional performance improvements and features. And then finally, SQL Server on an Azure VM. So I'm using the Azure extensions, the portal interfaces, templates, whatever. Now I can select to use premium SSD v2. Now this is quite a lot like UltraDisk. It doesn't quite scale the IOPS and the throughput as high. The latency isn't quite as low, but I can independently pick the IOPS and the throughput. I can change them dynamically so it's a higher performance disk and more flexible. I can now opt to use premium SSD v2 in preview when I'm doing that provisioning through Azure. This is for the EBD and the EBS uh, V5 SKUs. And I even get the option to pick the NVMe. So by default, it will use SCSI. Um, for the protocol for the connectivity to the premium SSD v2, but I can opt to use NVMe. There's not really a downside. It will give you higher performance. It doesn't cost you any extra. Miscellaneous, so the Azure API Center has gone GA. So this is your centralized home for all of your organization's API. It provides inventory, so I get a catalog for the APIs available in my organization, which therefore means it makes them easier to discover, makes them easier to leverage. I can use it to enforce different API design rules that I, as an organization, have as standards, and I can do that at scale. I can see a report of all the RESTful APIs. Uh, I can get API analysis. It can generate SDKs for languages from those APIs. It can do a lot of other features to make them available for the authentication 
um, throttling, etc. There's a new Mexico Central region. Yes, it supports availability zones. This is the first cloud region in Mexico. Entra now has external authentication methods in preview. So we had custom controls before. This would let us use an external MFA solution. Now we just have these external authentication methods. So if I'm using an external MFA like Duo, RSA, Entrust, huge number of additional ones, I can now go and light those up and leverage them for things like PIM uh, within Entra. And for all you Mac OS people out there, we now have platform SSO. Now, initially this platform SSO works with Microsoft Intune as the MDM, but it is coming to other MDM solutions. It supports things like password lists with smart cards, with the secure enclave, which is like Windows Hello for Business in a Windows term. It also can do a password sync with the local account that lets you sign into local machine with your Entra ID password. But now you're gonna get that single sign-on experience uh, when I'm leveraging those Entra trusting resources, which could be, again, many different third-party SaaS solutions, etc. And that was it. Uh, as always, I hope that was useful. Till next video, take care.